Welcome everyone. I'm Brandon Baker, Vice President of Development at RAND. Thanks for joining us as we bring RAND to you remotely. Our RAND Remote Event Series is designed to keep you informed while we're staying safer at home. To me, being safe and feeling safe are two separate things. I was surprised by how underprepared I was at the start of this pandemic. I think many of us were caught off guard by how devastating and how long this pandemic would actually last. Many of us are used to dealing with crises like natural disasters. In Alabama, where I grew up, we all knew what to do when there was a tornado warning. Here in California, we don't have the same warning systems for earthquakes, but there's still plenty of ways that we can be prepared should one strike. But a pandemic? How can you even prepare for this? I don't have the answer, but many of our RAND researchers are working on this now. They were prepared and they jumped into action to help our decision makers respond to this crisis and to plan for our future. They're taking a close look at our institutions, like our healthcare and emergency response systems, and working to strengthen and safeguard them. This is one of the many priorities of RAND's Tomorrow Demands Today fundraising campaign. Our conversation today will focus on pandemic recovery. I'm joined by Peter Hussey, Vice President and Director of RAND Healthcare, and Courtney Gadangle, a physician and the director of RAND's Boston office. Peter, Courtney, thank you both so much for taking the time to be with us today to talk about uh, this pandemic and the recovery. Um, so let's get started. Peter, you know, it seems like information about COVID-19 is changing every day. Why is that? Well, there's a tremendous amount of information being generated all the time. There are research teams focused on this problem all around the world. That's really good news in a way, but it also makes for a very chaotic information landscape. Um, the growth in, in terms of scientific articles being published has just been exponential. And the process has changed as well. So it's not just the volume, it's how the information is released. Things that had previously happened maybe behind a curtain are now happening out in public. So we've seen scientific articles published on what they call preprint servers. Um, before they have been vetted. Typically, before the pandemic in the medical field, you'd have peer reviewers that are scrubbing and then uh, results and then things are being revised. Now that's all being done out in the open. And uh, so sometimes results are changed after they've been reported on. There are headlines, um, of course, about these preprint articles because everybody is starving for new information about what we know about this pandemic and what to expect. Um, but the result can be a little bit, it can feel like a little bit of whiplash. The other thing that is typical with scientific evidence is that our collective understanding accumulates over time with multiple studies. And um, that can feel like things are changing. That's the way the process works. Usually it's a little bit out of the public eye now everybody's paying attention and it's happening day to day. The other trend I want to point to that can make it feel like um, you know things are changing or can muddy up the information landscape has been there's also been trends of increasing amounts of misinformation and disinformation um, contributing to what we at RAND have um, identified as truth decay. And it really contributes to the four, four aspects of truth decay that we point to and that's decreasing trust in formerly trusted institutions, increasing disagreement about interpretations of facts and data, a blurring of what's opinion and what's fact, and an increasing relative influence of opinion over fact. And we're seeing all of that um, to a great extent with everything related to COVID. Yeah, so just to add to what Peter said, I think you know what else makes this difficult is that the nature of the virus is you know, making it very tricky to characterize. So there's just been so much to learn. I would say that scientists and physicians have a, a good understanding of the non-novel coronaviruses, which are the cold viruses that circulate during cold and flu season. But this virus has had, you know, some surprising features that make its behavior a little bit difficult to predict. Um, things like loss of taste and smell, these small thrombi or clots throughout the body that cause manifestations like COVID toes that people might have heard about. And then this very um, prominent aspect of the post-infectious inflammation, you know, that's not unheard of um, with viruses, but it seems to happen with a higher proportion after this. And certainly we don't typically see that after the common cold. Um, at the same time, we're seeing this relative sparing of vulnerable populations, such as young children, 
with most infections, we see sort of a, a bimodal distribution of where uh, people get sick, the very young and the very old. And this really seems to, to um, target the, the older population more so than the younger. Um, Peter mentioned that, you know, scientists and clinicians are trying to um, understand this virus really simultaneously across the world in every country. And I think this eagerness to advance knowledge has just resulted in a massive amount of information that um, clinicians, decision makers really need to have thoughtfully synthesized in a way that, you know, Rand is very used to doing through mechanisms like our EPC or Evidence-Based Practice Center so that we can draw meaningful conclusions, avoid overwhelming decision makers, really assess the quality of evidence, particularly because a lot is coming out prior to peer review, um, and ultimately guide strategies to contain um, and treat the infection. Yeah, there is a lot of overwhelming information coming out um, daily. And with this changing information and the recommendations, um, you know, how are policymakers making those decisions right now about how to proceed during this pandemic? Well, they're uh, essentially in the fog of war. Um, they're putting out fires. Um, they don't have very much bandwidth. They're facing urgent decisions every day. And in some cases may lack access to the expertise they need to sort through this information chaos. So one example, if we go back to um, say early March, we were in a landscape where there were real concerns about overwhelming our hospital capacity and particularly intensive care capacity. Would we have enough in, in some of the hotspots where outbreaks were developing? And in, res in response to that, many groups um, developed models um, that produce scenarios of, of what we can expect. And um, those were used by policymakers, but they, they sometimes conflicted. Um, they resulted in conflicting uh, recommendations. Um, there's a common saying about models, which is that they're always wrong, but they're sometimes useful. Um, they're only as good as the information and the assumptions that go in, and they're made for different purposes. Um, so sometimes uh, decision makers need to understand what the purpose of the model is, what some of the decisions that were made, the assumptions. And in some cases, we also saw there were actually some technical flaws in some of the models that were feeding in. All that um, fit into the decision making process. Um, so going back to that decision, I think what policymakers were faced with was conflicting information, a lot of unknowns, and they made decisions in that limited evidence environment, essentially to avoid a worst case scenario. And I think the good news is we've mostly avoided that, that worst case scenario, even in places like New York, we pretty much um, came back from the brink of, of totally overwhelming our hospital resources. But we still face a series of, of challenging problems like that. Um, and the, the evidence base has advanced somewhat, uh, but is still largely the same type of scenario that we, they were confronting at that time. There's been scant coordination of planning across the country. So what we've seen is uh, different states and localities taking different approaches. They're using different data and, um, and evidence to make their decisions, but moreover, they're, make, they're using different objectives um, and metrics for assessing those objectives. And um, that can lead to, you know, uh, very difficult to explain changes between areas that might be right next to each other. Um, and, uh, and it can also contribute to something, there's, an, there's a consideration that, or a, a perception that um, we have a dichotomy. You know, we can either improve public health or improve the economy. And really those things should be considered together along with all the other social effects. Uh, policymakers should be uh, uh, choosing those all together, uh, but it's often not discussed that way. Um, a metaphor that we've used is that what's really needed is a physiology, uh, sort of the connective tissue, maybe the nervous system, a brain to connect all the different body parts, right? Right now what we have is essentially, you know, disjointed arms and legs that are kind of doing their own thing, moving without a lot of of connectivity between them. And we think that will be really important for decision-making moving forward. So Courtney, you know, as states and localities are beginning to relax some of the public health interventions like businesses and their closures, um, they're all taking different approaches, it seems. So how do we know what is working and what's not working? Yeah, I think that's the question of the hour as these measures are being relaxed. And I think it's going to remain a question probably throughout the pandemic, since it's likely that we may have to sort of relax and then tighten measures again. You know, the most commonly um, used metrics are new case transmissions. So how many new cases are we identifying, which does depend on testing. 
number of deaths, and then signs that the healthcare system is at risk of becoming overwhelmed, um, like hospitalizations and intensive care utilization. But the problem with almost all of these measures, and particularly the severe outcomes like deaths and hospitalizations, is that there's really a big lag just because of how this disease works. So unlike something like the flu, where people get sick pretty quickly and hospitalized relatively early in their course, we'll have people get infected, you know, another five or six days will pass as they get sicker, then they're hospitalized. And the average time from hospitalization to an outcome like um, death is can be pretty long. So we can expect to see hospitalizations and deaths start to peak up to four weeks after widespread community transmission, at, you know, at which point the horse is sort of out of the barn. Um, another challenge is that we know that in terms of controlling the infection, transmission is probably driven at least in part, if not large part, by people who have minimal symptoms, people who are going to get symptoms but don't have them yet, and even people who will never develop symptoms. So that makes this really challenging because it's even hard to really go by you know, symptom reporting. So rather than waiting for the signal that we know is delayed, that people are dying or being hospitalized or even presenting to care for testing, something like a very robust surveillance approach um, would be a really important alternative or complementary approach in addition to measuring those important outcomes. Um, by testing people proactively, um, and you know, across a population, we can help actually to detect a signal even before there are symptoms or in the absence of symptoms, and certainly before severe outcomes start to occur. Um, and you know, models can help us understand how those strategies might be able to um, help in terms of um, of our overall approach and strategies that decision makers can choose. Um, the good news is that we can really learn. There's been a lot of variation in terms of what states and cities and even countries are doing. Some places have been quite successful, you know, in varying contexts in terms of containing the spread of the virus. And so um, evaluating lessons learned um, really rigorously and in a systematic and thoughtful way, I think will be really important um, and an urgent need moving forward. So, you know, we've heard a lot about the shortages in medical supplies and including personal protective equipment and testing supplies. Why have these shortages been so persistent and are they getting better? Yeah, this is a complex issue. We've heard so much about it, um, even from early on, um, you know, that there was this lack of personal protective or what we call PPE. Uh, there's a lot of components to PPE, like masks, gloves, gowns, face shields, and we've seen shortages to varying degrees of all of those. We also know that um, uh, lots of components are needed to be in place for testing. So it's not just about having a working test, but the swabs to test people the staff to swap patients, lab personnel to run the test, and all of the reagents that are needed to run the test. So the ingredients that go into doing the test. Um, we know from our prior work on the system of care for infectious diseases that really drew on lessons learned from Ebola, that a huge challenge of being prepared for a pandemic is really investing um, in between pandemics or what we termed keeping the pilot light burning. In terms of always thinking about preparedness, um, and we heard that that was a challenge from healthcare facilities even before this pandemic hit, you know, it's hard for healthcare facilities to really reasonably invest in the amount of PPE that would be needed and the amount of testing supplies to the, you know, to the degree that would have been needed um, for this particular pandemic. And I think that's one of the big challenges that needs to be thought through, um, not just for this uh, current outbreak, but for future ones as well. Um, and in terms of PPE, testing supplies, as you mentioned, but also things like ventilators, staff that are appropriately trained in all the types of equipment that are needed. So, you know, given that healthcare facilities are unlikely to be able to really invest enough to have supplies to outfit their staff for days to months, possibly years on end, um, and in the absence of a, you know, a clear and transparent plan from, uh, you know, resources like the Strategic National Supply um, Stockpile, there has been this reliance on global supply chains and their ability to be scaled up quickly. But of course, we've seen with a pandemic that's worldwide that there's a disruption of these supply chains, which has been one of the big challenges. We also see, um, aside from being able to um, produce the supplies needed, that in terms of the distribution and allocation that states are competing with each other and with other countries for supplies. And this results in some states that maybe don't need them as much having excess supplies and shortages in other cities that are hot spots. Um, and then beyond that, it's not just healthcare facilities, it's every business, uh, big and small across the country, every school, every family, and every individual basically needs masks. Um, to start to safely re-engage um, in, in most basic activities, like going grocery shopping, hopefully one day returning to schools. So that's a lot of different actors at every level, um, trying to figure out and spending a lot of energy figuring out how to obtain needed supplies. And this is where I think RAND has been able and can shine a light on what the gaps are and also potential solutions. 
Um, so we did a recent analysis that looked at some pretty straightforward, simple strategies that could help allocate more efficiently uh, the creation of a backstop uh, supplier market that would help encourage hospitals to loan equipment to other hospitals in need with the guarantee that they would get supplies when their time of need came. And that could really work well when you think about early in the pandemic and Seattle being a hotspot and them um, sort of decreasing in their need, just as New York City and Boston were, were creeping up. Um, and I think, you know, these innovative approaches are needed, not just currently um, where there's an urgent need, but also uh, we need to be forward thinking about how we can all remain prepared for the next pandemic with reasonable investments in between. So let's talk a bit about the testing because this mm -hmm. is an, a very important issue and the availability of testing is an important issue. So what type of testing strategy is needed at this point in the United States and are we equipped to follow it? Yeah, testing has gotten a lot of attention as well, um, you know, starting with delays early in the pandemic in terms of rolling out CDC's tests to state labs. Um, and since then, I think a lot of laboratories um, have launched validated molecular tests, which are tests that detect the actual viral material in a matter of days to weeks, which is pretty astonishing because that process would otherwise, I think, typically take months or years to be developed and approved. But we still have insufficient capacity in part due to testing supplies that's really, I think, hampered our ability to respond to the pandemic and prevent spread. Um, there's sort of different ways that testing can be used or deployed in a strategy. So molecular testing that you obtain via swab is needed to identify current active infection using, um, using this test from a swab that can help with diagnosis, treatment, and ultimately reduce transmission by identifying quickly those who are potentially infectious. But a really important corollary to that is that you need to be able to get a test quickly, get results of the tests quickly, and then act upon those test results to prevent further infection through very um, rigorous contact tracing. Um, testing can also be used for surveillance to detect a signal before we start to see a surge, as I mentioned before, in hospitalizations and deaths. And for that type of strategy, um, probably both swabs uh, or the molecular testing and antibody testing could be used. So these types of studies could really help us to understand community spread, uh, help us understand herd immunity, how does infection spread within households, which populations are at risk and even why. And we do see these studies being launched, but independently and really without um, coordinated planning, sometimes with limited validity and reliability because of how they recruit people to these studies. And so that, you know, has the risk of wasting precious time in a pandemic um, and also resources. Um, so, you know, I would say there's this very an urgent need to design testing strategies that are thoughtful, that combine the right tests, that give us a really representative picture of infection, including in difficult to reach subpopulations like um, nursing home residents uh, and disadvantaged communities. Um, you asked about whether we're equipped to follow that type of testing strategy, and I, I think that really depends on whether we're willing to invest in the type of infrastructure that would be needed to implement testing and contact tracing, which, um, you know, needs to be pretty extensive. I think ultimately, um, effective and thoughtful models can help support that type of decision making in terms of whether to invest in such strategies and whether they're likely to pay off in terms of considering both the health and the economic benefits um, as, as we try to safely reopen. Yeah, could you talk a bit more about the progress that we're making in finding a treatment for COVID-19? And, and also, you know, what's the status of a vaccine? Yeah, so the good news is that there's really sort of an unprecedented amount of research being conducted worldwide, as Peter alluded to. Um, in terms of treatment so far, there's been good progress made with remdesivir, uh, which is an antiviral treatment that can be given intravenously or through an IV. Um, and would currently really only be feasible for patients already sick enough to be hospitalized. So it's great that we have that type of treatment. It's not something that can really be widely deployed to people that are fairly sick, but in the community. So, you know, I think a lot of people would love to see attention shift to potentially outpatient antiviral treatments that could be initiated maybe with the goal of decreasing infectiousness, which would have a great benefit and preventing hospitalizations and deaths in the first place. I do think that will be a challenge. Um, because antivirals just tend to be harder to develop than something like antibiotics. They tend to be a little less sort of slam dunk effective and tend to have more adverse events just when you sort of compare those classes. Um, you know, another challenge is just sifting through all the information about potential treatments. Again, we have lots of information coming out. Sometimes before these results from trials are being made public through publications, you know, we have political leaders and appointees discussing and promoting treatments either in the absence of or just ahead of trial results. And that just really makes it challenging, I think for the public, for decision makers to know what to trust 
and what the current state of science is, which will be very important looking forward to ensuring public buy-in of a vaccine or future pre you know, uh, preventive or outpatient or other treatments. You know, in terms of vaccines, I think there is a lot of promise there. Um, we are seeing vaccines making it through phase one trials. I would just caution that there are some caveats. So in general, more vaccines tend to fail than not. So it's good that we have a lot of candidates. Um, outside of a pandemic, I don't think the public usually follows, you know, the trajectory of vaccines as closely as many of us are currently, but it is a lengthy process, starting with when a promising candidate vaccine is identified, all the way through all the phases of, of testing. Um, and of course, the tension there is balancing speed of development with rigorous safety evaluation. And there, you know, in terms of safety, it's very important, obviously, to make sure that a vaccine is safe before it's uh, given to an entire population. But also, it's very important to ensure public buy-in by not, you know, having the perception of cutting corners, um, you know, to develop a speedy vaccine. We know that uh, public acceptance of vaccines for outbreaks tends to be really, really high early on. We looked at this for H1N1 using the American Life Panel. But the acceptance and willingness to take the vaccine plummeted well before the vaccine became available, but while the while infection was still ongoing. So, you know, I think that those are sort of going to be the challenges in addition to identifying a vaccine, distributing it, is then making sure that people will be willing to actually receive the vaccine. Since this crisis started um, and we went into shutdown over 75 days ago, you know, we went from dealing with the immediate res emergency response to recovery efforts. So looking ahead over the next six to 12 months, what do you see as the biggest issue on the horizon? Well, like like many people, I've, I've sort of lost my sense of time, but um, it is important to think about six to 12 months. Uh, it seems like so far away, but that'll be on us before we know it. Um, I think focused on the virus itself, um, the big question will be, uh, will there be a second wave of infections? Like we saw, for example, after the 1918 flu, um, there was a big spike in infections, actually a larger wave in the fall. Um, there are various scenarios about how that could play out, but you know it's likely that something like that will happen either in a large peak or in a series of sort of rolling waves. So a big question is, you know, what which of those scenarios actually occurs? Does it coincide with flu season? If so, how bad will flu season be this year? And overall, um, will hospitals have adequate capacity? We'll be back to that set of questions again. If we do end up in that scenario, a related question will be, would people tolerate another lockdown, another period of um, business closures, schools staying closed? Will they comply? Or are we sort of through the period where we're able to tolerate that? Um, that's an important question because it does seem like that has been effective so far in, in limiting the spread of the virus. And we don't have at this point in time uh, many other tools to apply. Thinking more broadly beyond you know, just the virus itself, um, I think there are big questions over six to 12 months about what some of the other health and social effects will be that are related to the pandemic, but not directly caused by the coronavirus. So um, what are the effects, for example, of isolation, of people deferring medical care for other conditions, of financial hardship related to unemployment and those types of things? Um, those will all be, I think, really important questions that really start to come into focus um, over the next six to 12 months as the acute phase of recovery ends. I think over this period, it's also important, we're so focused on the US. Uh, you know, the US has been, um, certainly we've had more cases than any, any other country in the world. But what we're seeing now is that some other countries that were, have been spared so far, uh, relatively anyway, in terms of their outbreaks, um, are now seeing an increasing number of cases. So countries like India and Brazil, um, for example. And a big question will be um, how severe will the outbreaks be in those countries? How well will their health systems be able to, to deal with it? Um, and maybe on a more positive note, are there things they can learn from some of the other countries that have been through um, the major uh, wave and have been more successful that could make it uh, there could be good things to, to borrow that would make it um, better in, in some of those other countries. And then finally, going back to the vaccine, I think we're all looking forward to the day that we have a safe and effective vaccine available, hopefully. Um, once that becomes available, which potentially could happen over that six to 12 or maybe a little bit longer uh, month time frame, um, big question will be then how do we get it to people? How many people will refuse it? You know, Will enough people get vaccinated to achieve herd immunity? Um, and how can we effectively and efficiently distribute the vaccine 
given that it's going to be important to get it out around the world, uh, how can we distribute that effectively? Um, because that is um, ultimately where we where we will need to be to really get through uh, this case of this uh, pandemic. Yeah, staying on this this uh, theme of the future and and a much more positive outlook here. What is RAND doing to help decision makers not only address these issues but to be more prepared for the future? Yeah, so we're active in a lot of different areas, um, including all the areas that we've talked about here and um, some others that we perhaps only touched on or maybe haven't talked about uh, in detail. So that works um, happening across RAND um, in our national security divisions, uh, work on schools and, and uh, in our workforces and our education and labor department, for example. So really a wide range of things across RAND, as you'd expect, given the, you know, the all-encompassing nature of the pandemic. A few of the highlights that I'll mention among, among many that I could have chosen, uh, one of the first things that we did was develop um, so a report on strategies and also a tool that hospitals are using to manage their critical care capacity um, to help them surge and now undo that surge in some places. And uh, they'll continue to use that, I think, over the next period as they continue to adjust their, their capacity to the current needs. Another tool um, that I'm very proud of that I'd highlight is one that produces scenarios aimed at state and local decision makers, understand um, what happens, what's likely to happen when they relax and potentially reinstitute some of the public health interventions we've seen, like the business closures and the school closures and so forth. And our tool considers not just the virus transmission, it considers that, but also the economic effects and also looks at a range of other potential criteria that policymakers should consider. And so it's a pretty comprehensive, more comprehensive, I think, than some of the other frameworks that are out there and very flexible in terms of um, allowing us to look at different scenarios of if how quickly we relax things and over what period uh, we do that and what the likely effects are going to be. Um, another area we're working on is in how we can use data on people's mobility or people they've gone into contact with. You can use people's cell phones, for example. Uh, Google and Apple have developed a technology to do this. And um, there's a challenge there in doing that while also balancing the privacy concerns that people have. And that's something we've been working on of what, what's a framework we can employ to make the best use of those kinds of data. Final area that I'll call out is just trying to understand some of the changes in healthcare that we've seen um, that have been spurred on by the pandemic. So we've seen a real uh, leap into telemedicine um, and some of that's been actually really positive in some cases. We wanna learn from that. Um, we've seen lots of challenges in long-term care, you know, particularly in nursing homes, but also for things like home health. And so I think it'll be extremely important uh, for RAND to help the world understand uh, the implications of those changes and how we can emerge into a better post-COVID world. No, that's that's great. You know, we've um, had a few of these briefing series already, and um, we're continuing to be in awe about all the research that's coming out from RAND um, that's supporting our decision makers during this COVID-19 uh, crisis. What do you think are the biggest questions about COVID-19 that you know RAND can help answer? You know, there's still certainly a lot more that needs to be done. I mean, this is a um, monumental challenge um, that's facing us. So I'm proud of what we're doing so far, but there's certainly a lot more that we, we should could and should be doing. Um, as we discussed at the beginning of the conversation, I think the this idea of information chaos, I think that that is something that Rand is extremely well suited to address. Um, we are a trusted independent source of analysis. Um, we can produce our own analysis, but we can also play an important role in synthesizing, as Courtney mentioned, in helping policymakers understand how to distill the various sources of evidence and use it for the decisions that are in front of them. So I think that that, that general role would be an extremely important for one for us to play. And there's a few specific questions I think that we could apply that to um, very well, um, many of which we touched on. So uh, just a few examples, how can we best use statistical dashboards and other tools to understand the spread of the virus um, and mitigation strategies? I think we could do that more effectively, more comprehensively, um, understand what do we know actually today about how many people have been infected. Right now, we still don't really have a very good grasp of that. Um, 
how many people have been infected, how many people have died and so forth. Um, so I think we could do that better. Um, Courtney spoke very well about um, our testing capabilities. I think we could, we could do a lot um, to help answer that about how to design the best strategies and how to update those as the nature of the pandemic changes. One thing we haven't touched on perhaps is supporting our frontline healthcare workers. Um, how do we um, uh, detect and support them uh, with mental illnesses um, and some of the stress uh, brought on by some of the stress that they've been facing as they're grappling with this pandemic in this really acute phase and it's gonna continue um, the stresses on that workforce, incredibly important. How are different groups experiencing COVID? So we know it's been very unequal. Um, it's affected some populations much harder than others. Uh, what do we know about why that's happening? And more, most importantly, what we can do about that. Um, we talked a little bit about the experience of other countries and, and um, also about vaccine development. I think an important uh, issue that RAND could help address is how can the international community best collaborate on both development of the vaccine, but then also on the delivery of the vaccine when it's available. But finally, and most importantly, um, I think looking forward, I think RAND could help us address after this pandemic, for the next pandemic, which we know will come, will be different, but will come, what can we do better uh, next time? How can we be more prepared uh, for that crisis and other crises? And as I mentioned earlier, how can we prepare in general for a better post-COVID world? There's lots of things we can learn from this. And it'd be really important that we learn from those lessons and, and build on that um, to put us on a stronger footing in the future. Peter, Courtney, thank you both so much, not only for just being here and talking with us today, but for the research, for the work that you're doing um, to get us through this pandemic, but also to come out on the other side of it um, even more successful. Um, we're grateful for what you um, are doing. And so thank you again for spending some time with us today. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. As we all adjust to today's reality and start to plan for tomorrow, we hope you'll stay connected to RAND. Join us on Thursday, June 11th for the next RAND remote conversation. You can find more information at campaign.rand.org slash events, or reach out to us at randremote at rand.org with any questions. Times have changed since the creation of NATO and NASA, the World Health Organization, and the World Bank, from colleges and courts to the military and the media, are the many institutions we've relied on to keep us educated, safe, and informed still meeting our needs today? Technology has transformed our lives and changed the way we communicate. Speed and ease of transaction guide our high-tech world. But have they made us less safe? The networks that make it possible for you to connect with your family and friends around the world also connect terrorist groups and their followers. You can have groceries delivered with the push of a button, but there are also websites that trade in weapons and humans. Who is responsible when your self-driving car crashes? What happens when an algorithm denies you access to healthcare or a loan to start a business? From cyberspace to outer space, now is the time to rethink the roles and responsibilities of our institutions and our place in the world. Imagine a tomorrow where sound policy drives stability, prosperity, health, and well-being. Can you imagine a more secure tomorrow? We can. Tomorrow demands today. <laughs>